I'm Simon Dobson. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of St Andrews. And I'm here to talk about uh, exploring epidemic spreading using network models. Now, there's there's probably a couple of uh, I'm assuming you can all see the you can all see my see my slides. Um, there's a couple of, uh, of sort of, of sort of caveats in a in a sense for this um, to this talk. The first is that I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm a computer scientist. I'm interested in epidemic processes, not in uh, in epidemics per se. Well, that seems like a really rather technical um, difference when we're in the middle of a pandemic. So some of the work we've been doing with with complex processes and complex networks has has great relevance to the to the situation we find ourselves in. Epidemic modeling has become very very popular. It's a huge field. It draws on uh, all sorts of different kinds of maths, statistics, computational techniques. And what I want to do today is explore one tiny part, which is epidemic processes working over complex contact networks. Um, what, what are the possibilities that this can show us? And can we, can we make the tools more accessible? Can we make these sorts of techniques available to more people? And, and maybe can we generate some insights for later empirical investigation? Because of course, this is only modeling. Um, it tells us what what might be true, uh, and and potentially lets people go off and see whether those things are found actually in the in the real world. The structure of the talk, I'm going to give you some background on how how one does disease modelling for those who who don't know. Then we'll talk about how we how we move this onto networks, and then some explorations that we've done in the in the space of uh, of, uh, of epidemic models. Now, real diseases, we all we've all been sick. We all know what what diseases are like, but they all have a fairly common common structure that we can divide up into different periods. So there is, for example, an typically an incubation period from the from the point at which one is infected to the onset of symptoms. You incubate the disease, and there's a latent period from the point at which you're in, you're infected, you're 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 exposed to the point at which you're infectious, and those two um, those two periods to combine, you get an infectiousness period where you can you have a disease and you can pass it on to others and the, the these may overlap in different ways so it may be that you become infectious and then you become symptomatic then you show signs of the disease or it may be the other way around you show signs of the disease and only then do you become infectious these periods and the way they interact are all defined by the biology it's typically it's the biology of the disease but also the biology of the host and we've seen lots of different different kinds of uh, diseases. They're, they're broadly designed, de defined into, into type A and type B, um, depending on whether you become infectious before or after you show symptoms. Now, in the case of a, of a disease like Ebola, which is a type B disease, you have an onset of symptoms and only then do you become infectious. So in other words, if you encounter somebody without symptoms, they are not infectious. On the other hand, with other diseases like, like measles, um, if you encounter somebody without symptoms, well, they may be infectious because they become infectious before their symptoms uh, arise. Um, we have, in, in the space of coronaviruses, we actually have type A and type B. SARS is a, SARS is a, is a, is a type B, um, so, it, so infectiousness turns up after, after symptoms. Um, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 is, 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 uh, is a type A. You get infectiousness before you get, um, before you get symptoms. Uh, before you get set, before you get symptoms showing. Now, the thing that's important to remember about all of these diseases, of course, in the real world, is that they're changing all the time. So, when we talk about an epidemic or a disease in the real world with real diseases, actually, the person who gets the gets the uh, the infection at the end of the epidemic got a different disease to the guy who got it at the start, because as the as the infection as the pathogen has moved through the population, it's been evolving. And, it, and changing, and this this happens relatively rapidly. It, it, and again, it varies depending on the exact disease. Pathogens are constantly mutating. Now, if you know something about evolution and and, and how and how um, genetics operates, um, I thought I did as well. It's totally different in bacteria and in viruses. You get all sorts of lateral gene transfers where where um, pathogens share genes with other with other pathogens within the same host. It all gets horrifically complicated. Uh, I don't pretend to understand it. It's a reason why, it, another reason why it's important to work to reduce transmission, because the more people are infected, the more chances of this lateral gene transfer there are. And this is how diseases pick up genes, for example, for jumping the, to jump the, to jump the species barrier. 
um, to jump out of to, to jump from from example from 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 sheep into humans what typically happens is the sheep virus lands in a person who also has the human variant of that similar virus and they exchange genes and all of a sudden the sheep virus can can propagate in in humans that's how species jumping works of course because we've got evolution going on here we've also got selection pressure so the diseases that are that are that are surviving that are getting more traction within the population are, are being selected by by natural selection according to the to the ways that the, the most beneficial ways the fitness function if you like which are the, what are the fittest um, the fittest variants now selection pressure can work in a whole load of different ways but what it often does is it generates as the disease goes on it generates diseases which are more transmissible but less severe so in other words they're easier to transmit between between individuals but they are less severe and last for longer inside those individuals. And it's easy to see why those are the ones that will spread more. They'll be, they'll be more transmissible and they'll hang around for longer. They won't debilitate the host. So you'll get better spread. And those are the, the, those are the ones that will, get, that will be selected. And gradually, this is why the diseases tend to, tend to die out a lot of the time. Gradually, they become less and less severe. And eventually, your immune system can simply tread on them. And that's, and that's, uh, and that's the end of that. Um, we've heard an awful lot about, about R numbers recently. We're now, we're now all kind of experts in, in, in R numbers. R is, is what's referred to as the, as the case reproduction number. It's the number of secondary cases per primary on average. And we are particularly interested if from a disease perspective in R0, which is the, um, the, the R number um, absent any countermeasures. So the R, R, the R number for a disease which is sitting in a, in a totally susceptible, um, totally undefended population, the worst, the worst case in a, in, a, in a way. We also have other various numbers, which are also called R, which is really rather, rather irritating. Because the case reproduction rate, essentially the doubling time for an, for an epidemic, the, the, the exponent on the, uh, on the exponential growth. You sometimes also see the intergeneration time, tells you how, how fast the disease is going, to, is going to spread. So R tells you, if you like, the width of the disease, how wide it's going to go, and, R to, and the little R tells you how fast it's going to get there. Um, so little R will tell you the size, so big R will tell you the size, little R will tell you about the, about the rapidity with which it will spread. And you can, you can imagine that both of those numbers are rather significant, especially if you're trying to, for example, preserve your health service as people get, as people get increasingly sick. Now, typically those numbers, big R and small R, and actually most of the other numbers that, that get measured, they're averages, and they're averages over probably unknown distributions. And the details may actually be rather significant. So the fact that you have R numbers quoted as averages over particular populations can be quite misleading because, the, because it obviously depends on what population you choose to do the, to do the averaging over. Now, this talk is not particularly about COVID-19, but under the circumstances, it's probably as well to talk about what it is that makes COVID such a wicked problem. And this idea of wicked problems, ones that all the solutions are kind of bad, is, is, is really showing up in, in our response to, to COVID-19. So if you look at R0 for, for, for COVID-19, for SARS-CoV-2, for the, for, the, um, for the virus, it's somewhere between two and a half and three and a half. Um, it, it's not entirely clear exactly where, so call it three. On, uh, uh, that's not particularly infectious. It's about as infectious as a uh, as a severe winter as a severe winter flu in terms of how of how it will it will it will spread. Um, for comparison, the R zero number for measles in an unvaccinated population is about fourteen, and those are exponents. So you can imagine how how brutally fast and brutally broad a measles epidemic can get. Now it turns out that it's relatively straightforward to get R down to about one and a half, but as we can see, it's really difficult to get R under one. And getting R under one is the thing that we need in order to have the disease start to contract. And we have to maintain R under one to keep the disease contracting until it's been eliminated. There are various other wickednesses that are coming out. We've seen over the last couple of weeks, um, a more transmissible new variant seems to be emerging. Now, as I said a moment ago, that's a way the selection pressure typically works. So the emergence of a more transmissible variant is in, is in no way surprising. Um, it, it's, it, it's kind of to be expected. Um, COVID also has what, what, the, what proper epidemiologists call overdispersion, which is, is essentially the existence of super spreaders. A small number of individuals are responsible for a large number of cases. 
So that, so that's a measure of how of how the averaging how, how if you like averages are a little bit a little bit distorting. Over dispersion tells you that there is a, there are there are super spreader events going on, um, for reasons that are not entirely clear. That may be to do with biology, maybe to do with sociology, and probably both. We also don't know whether infection conveys total permanent immunity. It certainly delivers temporary immunity. Um, it may that that immunity may be temporary and may be partial, and it may and it may disappear, or it or it may be permanent. So we don't we simply don't know that this disease has only has only been known for less than a year. Um, it's a, astonishing how much we know about it already. Though, but there's a an, an equally astonishing amount that we don't know about. We also now know, which we didn't know at the start of the epidemic, that there's substantial asymptomatic transmission. People are transmitting this disease. Before they show, before they show any symptoms, and in some cases they actually never show any symptoms, or certainly never show symptoms that are serious enough to um, to, to actually lead to a um, to a proper diagnosis. There's all sorts of, of other things that sort of flow from that. Um, the costs of addressing COVID-19 are, are, are highly asymmetric. Um, if you want to put it crudely, and this is this is a very a very crude um, very crude statement. People spreading the disease are not necessarily the ones who are going to be um, who are going to be taking most of the hit, who are dying who are dying from it, um, and also we have to factor into this the existence of long COVID, which is really not understood at all. That some of the people who are actually infected and are, and do become sick will persist in that sickness for far longer than than anybody had predicted beforehand. The last of the of the the difficulties here is is that effective countermeasures are collective and this is because we've got this asymptomatic transmission if you have if, if you if you become symptomatic before you become infectious then the countermeasures you can take are local to you as soon as you become sick you isolate yourself and there is no danger that you would that you will have infected anybody else with covid that doesn't work so we need collective countermeasures and those countermeasures are expensive they have to be um, they have to be put together they have to be managed and they have to be performed collectively. And everybody's behavior affects the safety of everybody else in, in ways that are perhaps less, less the case in, in, other, in other diseases. Um, the infection fatality rate, so the number of people who are infected who will then, um, who, who will then subsequently die is about 1%. That's about 10 times, various ways of 10 times um, greater than than a seasonal than a seasonal flu, and it's it's in an awkward space again in the in the in the possible the possible space of um, uh, of diseases. That's too large to comfortably ignore a one percent fatality rate, but it's too small to generate a universal consensus about how serious things are. If you have some a disease like Ebola, where the where the where the fatality rate is 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 is, is about forty percent or higher, actually, actually for Ebola it's much higher than that. It's it's well above fifty. Um, Nobody's going to argue with you about how serious this is. This is obviously, obviously a nightmare. One percent, way too big to be ignored. Not so big that it won't, that it doesn't generate. Um, it, it, it does. It fails to generate a consensus. Um, and we're also, of course, seeing misinformation um, and, and misinterpretation of the numbers uh, of the numbers flying around um, quite quite significantly. So, what are the goals of modelling? In, in, in exploring these, um, um, exploring these sorts of ideas. Well, there's, there's, there's kind of modeling sort of falls into two different categories. There's the concrete version. How will this particular outbreak behave in this particular population? This is the stuff that's really relevant to public health and public health policy. Um, what is actually gonna happen with this specific disease as it moves through the UK as it is, the real world. Then there's abstract modeling, which is, how do diseases behave in general? Are the general mathematical structures that one finds across diseases and, and actually across all sorts of other epidemic processes, which are is a broader class of um, class of problem than just diseases? Are there sort of common structures in here? And this is much more where 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 I'm interested in. Um, the way we model these diseases is we use what are typically what are called compartmented models. It's a framework for designing a model of a, of a disease. And the compartments are, you can think of them as buckets that hold some fraction of the population. Um, you can also think of, the, of a compartment as the, as the state of each individual within the population. We'll come back to that view later. But for the time being, let's think of them as buckets. 
And there are rules saying, how do people move, how do individuals or fractions of the population move between the buckets? Now, as soon as you say something like that to a mathematician, you immediately think, oh yeah, differential equations. And you'd of course be quite right. The most common, commonly, commonly encountered model of this form is called, is called SIR, susceptible, infected, removed. The idea is that you have three buckets, S, I, and R, susceptible, infected, and removed. Um, most of the individuals sit in the susceptible bucket, and there's a few in the infected bucket. And susceptible individuals catch the infection from infected individuals. So over time, the population in the susceptible bucket goes down, and the population in the infected bucket goes up. But also over time, people in the infected bucket are being removed. They are either recovering or dying. And you'll notice SIR doesn't distinguish between those two, although they are kind of important. Um, so we simply remove people who take no further part in the dynamics. They are no longer infectious, either because they have recovered and become immune, or because they are dead and presumably beyond caring. We can then define some epidemic dynamics parameters over these equations that says, well, susceptibles, we can have susceptibles infected per contact um, with some probability beta. So every time an infected and a susceptible person meet, there's some probability beta that, that, one, that the, the infected will infect the susceptible and therefore move that other individual into the infected bucket. And the infectors are being removed with a probability alpha. And this incidentally gives rise to how you can define R as, as beta over alpha, the, the, the number of, of infecteds for the period for which the, the, uh, the individuals are, um, are infected. And we end up with three differential equations. And having got those three differential equations, we can then solve them. We get some nice curves. Um, I did this using the very, you know, using very straightforward the Euler method. And um, the equations are well defined. Um, and away we go. And you can solve them. And actually, most disease models, and most particularly most um, disease models used for policymaking, are done exactly like this with differential equations. And there is a host of, of knowledge about different kinds of compartmented models that we might decide to use. There's SIR. SIR implies that when you, be, when you have been infected, when you recover from your infection, you are then permanently immune. You take no further part in the disease. You may as well be gone. SIS, on the other hand, susceptible infected, susceptible, means there is no immunity conferred by infection at all. You immediately become susceptible again, and you can be reinfected and reinfected. SEIR, susceptible, exposed, infected, removed, models those diseases in which you can be exposed and be infectious before you're symptomatic. There's then another variant, M, SEIR, maternal, uh, susceptible, blah, 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 where um, an initial immunity is passed from mother to child, which happens for quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of, uh, of diseases, particularly tropical diseases, actually, but, but for quite a lot of diseases. And then we have SEIRS, um, susceptible, exposed, infected, removed, susceptible. You move out of the removed category and go back to being susceptible after some, after some period of time. You get partial immunity. And you can carry on doing this stuff. And there are, there are, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of, um, of different versions of these models, different, different, different types. Um, now, there are benefits and limitations to, as to, to this as to all modeling techniques. The advantage is it's really flexible. It's really scalable. So really appropriate for public health. You can model a population of 77 million people of the size of the UK. Um, very, very flexible. It has some limitations as well. Um, it's a little bit tricky to get heterogeneity. So in other words, if you have subpopulations who are, for example, living in places which are less dense, where you will get fewer infections passed along because they live in the country rather than in the city. Or you have... A, you have in the, as is the case with, with COVID, you have age, aged populations where the people in the older brackets are massively more at risk than the people in the younger, in the younger brackets, um, which we, is unclear why, but is certainly the case. Now we can model that um, by having subpopulations with their own parameters and then modeling the flows between them. So how often is it that young people meet older people and therefore work out what the, what the likely transmission of infection between these different subpopulations is. Um, and there's an entire suite of data sets called Polymod, which, which helps, to, helps to model that and, and is used extensively to model flows between populations. Um, these things, of course, 
have the disadvantage when as soon as you start getting into these um, more complex scenarios, they do tend to make this, the, the, uh, the system stochastic, which means you start having to worry about statistical effects. You start having to worry about variance. Um, you start having to worry about chance phenomena that may, that, that may make things behave differently. Um, and so the very, very simple SIR model, completely deterministic differential equations, as we start to move towards this, we start to get more um, more stochasticity into the, uh, um, into the system. So this brings us on to networks. There is a case for using network science rather than using this more continuous mathematics to describe uh, how epidemics work. Um, the basis for this is we take a network of individuals connected by, connected by edges where the edges are representing social contacts. And we use that, as, that network as a substrate on which to run an epidemic. And by a substrate, I mean that rather than any in infected individual infecting any susceptible, so all that matters is the relative sizes, the relative numbers of susceptibles and infected, only adjacent nodes can, in can interact. So only if affected, uh, only adjacent infected can eject, can, can affect susceptible. And so the number of those edges where, where in the network, where the node at one end is susceptible and the node at the other end is infected, all of a sudden become really important, the distribution of those, of those edges. And this means that we can um, build contact structures which are much more, much richer and, and have all sorts of, of additional, additional features in it, which are, which are they're not impossible, but they're harder to introduce into the, into the differential equation form. So we can build contact structures and systems of equations that, that we can't actually solve, but we can simulate. In many cases, we can solve them as well, but the, the, the techniques are different. But we can solve them, but we can certainly simulate them, and that's, re that's really useful. The major disadvantage is this does not scale as well as the differential equation form. It's fairly easy to see why. All the differential equation form cares about is the number of susceptibles or the number of infected or the fraction of the population that's in each, that's in each in each bucket, in each compartment. It's only one number. The network formulation is telling you what's happening to each individual person inside that, inside that population. So it's much more detailed, but it's much less scalable um, and really, really less scalable. So for the sorts of software that I'm going to talk about um, for the rest of this talk, you really can't get away with more than about 100,000 individuals. So you can't go up to the millions that you might like. So you're getting a benefit in terms of, in terms of the, the um, the flexibility to represent different contact structures and a disadvantage in terms of the scale at which you can do it. Um, the basic treatment inside networks is we take a degree distribution, the probability of a randomly chosen node having a degree K. And often we do this with, with what's referred to as a, mean, as a mean field approach. So take the mean degree of all the nodes in, in the network and solve the equations as though each of the nodes had that, that mean degree. It smears out the details, but quite often you can get a long way with, with, with doing that. You can then add fine structure. We can add loops in the network. We can add a sortativity so that people with very high degrees tend to be next to people with, very, with other high degree nodes and so on and so forth. We can have clusters which are much more connected than the clusters are between themselves. We can nest things within. We can do all sorts of fun stuff with the fine structure of the network. So lots of different networks with the same mean degree, essentially. And we can look at how those, how those features change the way the, the disease progresses. Um, we can also, we can look at adaptive behavior. We can change the features of the network over time or in, dis, in response to the disease. So we can look at adaptive countermeasures and how they might, how they might affect the way the disease works. And we'll see some of those examples later. Um, that's a network. A process over a network essentially assigns a state vector to each node. So for an epidemic, that might be the compartment that the node is in, susceptible, uh, infected, removed, or, or, or whatever, for whatever model we're using. And the process defines how the state vectors change. It's a function of the current state of a node and the states of its immediate neighbors, because those are the only ones that can, are the, are the only ones that can, that can interact. Um, generally speaking, again, this is a stochastic process. It's, it's um, it, the, the, the update is applied with some probability to each of the, um, each of the possible uh, each of the possible susceptible and um, susceptible infected pairs. And then we seed the network with additional, with initial state vectors. Typically that is mainly susceptible, drop a few infected in, in random places, crank the handle and see what happens. Um, now, if you want to do this, play this sort of, sort of game, um, 
there is a gold standard. And the gold standard is you find an analytic model that describes how your system works and draw some nice curves. And then you um, build a whole load of random networks with probably different topologies, run these disease, these disease equations over those networks, do lots of repetitions at each point in the parameter space. So you squeeze the variance out. And hopefully, if you're lucky, all the sample points land on the theoretical curves. And there is then much rejoicing. Um, I'm putting this picture up because this is a really great example that my student um, Peter Mann has, has, uh, has, has done. There's a red line that's theoretical. There's some circles that are, that are um, um, experimental results and they all sit smack on the, smack on the line. This is great. This is, this is, the, uh, this is the gold standard. Um, it quite often doesn't work like that. And, and, you, and, and then you have to start digging to, to see why it is that the numerics don't match the, the analytics. Now, to do this, these sorts of simulations, it's worth just briefly saying how you would do a simulation. It uses a system called Gillespie simulation that was initially developed for ab initio chemistry. It was one of the, one of the very early algorithms developed to simulate, um, simulate molecular interactions. Um, what it does is it, is, it, is it works in terms of events, somebody becoming infected, somebody recovering, and their probabilities, the probability of that event happening, um, and then asks, well, for a given system, when will the next event occur and what will it be? And then builds a discrete event simulator around that. So for an SIR model, the, um, the events are infection, an I node infects an S node, and which happens with some probability beta times the number of, of, of SI connections there are, the number of SI edges, the number of opportunities to infect. Or an I node is removed, with some, with, with, which happens at a, with a probability alpha i, depending on the size of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the infected nodes, the number of infected nodes. And each event, of course, changes the population of i nodes or the population of si edges. So at each, after each event, we have to recalculate the probabilities. They'll have, they'll have only changed slightly, but they will have changed, and then move this simulation forward. Um, since this is the IMA, I thought I ought to put some maths in. Um, what we're essentially doing here is we're defining a probability distribution over um, tor and e, or in other words, over the, over the events and over the, um, the time until the next event. So tor is the time from now to the next event, and e is the probability of that, uh, is, is what that event will be. And we're going to have to draw from this distribution, which has two, which has the two parameters. Um, you can't draw the two independently. They, they, are, they are jointly variable. Um, so we have to draw a te pair from inside this, inside this distribution. And given that, that, that we're not really sure about the shape of that distribution, it can get quite complicated. The analytical way of doing that is, is, is often, often unclear, but it turns out we can, we can do it computationally um, using, a, using a, a trick, which is what Gillespie identified, that we can take the probability distribution and for any, for any pr probability distribution, you can turn it into a cumulative probability density function. Now, the advantage of that is you can, you can then draw from that cumulative probability distribution, regardless of its shape, by simply using a couple of uniformly distributed random numbers. So all you need to do is generate two uniformly distributed random numbers, and then you can draw from this, um, from this complex, complex distribution. Um, and much mathematics yields the fact that we can take two numbers, R1 and R2, which are uniformly uh, distributed, drawn from, from the range of zero to one, and do some um, do some fairly simple calculations to get what is the, the time to the next event and the, and the identity of that, of that event. And the simulation loop, the discrete event simulation loop, simply runs that process through until equilibrium or, in, or until, thing, until things stabilize or, or until, it's, until it's clear that things, are, things are, uh, are approaching stability. Now, how do we do this? Well, there wasn't any standard tooling available. That we could find, and certainly not of the sort of flexibility we needed. So we built some. Um, we built we built a couple of systems, both written in Python. Um, one is called Epidemic. It's a flexible way to express networks and the processes over them. And we built reference implementations for all of the, the common epidemic processes and actually some other processes as well. Um, we built network generators that let us build networks with different topologies. Um, uh, we made use of Network X, which is the standard um, Python library for representing and manipulating networks. So we've simply layered 
uh, an epidemic simulation framework on top of the on top of an existing Python library. We then needed to run lots and lots of repetitions of these of these experiments at different points in a parameter space. So for different values of alpha and beta, for example, or for different degree distributions, or for different entirely different topologies, and we need to be able to do that repeatedly and uh, and repeatedly and repeatedly, repeatedly and repeatedly. Um, so we built a system for that, which is called EPIC, which is in computational experiment management, where we can simply hand over a parameter space and an experiment that we want to do, and it will go off and do it. And it will do it either locally using multi-core or remotely using a compute cluster and bring us the results back. And then store the, store the data off in a, in a fairly common scientific data format called HDF5, which, which lets us store the data in ways that, can, that it can then be, if necessary, ingested into tools other than ours. Um, just to give you an example of the sorts of things one can do with this sort of code, um, this is a piece of Python code. Um, the only thing to really take away from this is it's not very long. Um, that, that will run, well, we have a, um, we ha we have a space of about, of, of about 50, different, of, of 50 different points in the infection space, which is shown by that lab setting the NumPy lin space to with a number of 50. And at each point in that space, we're going to do 100 repetitions. So that code will, will run 5,000 instances of a, of a particular experiment. Um, and it will give us all of that, collect all that data back and, and, and put it in a notebook for us. And we can then go off and, and, and take that, import it into, into, a, into your favorite analytics library, um, and away you go. Um, in this particular case, that experiment will be done on a compute cluster. So all of those um, uh, experimental results would be scattered out over a compute cluster, run on that cluster, and then collected and collected back. Um, I can assure you it's not as easy as I just made it sound. Um, we've used this to do some, some explorations. And this is, the, this is the, main, the main part of the talk, if you like, what you can, what you can do with all this level of, this level of, of tooling. Um, we've been looking at different network structures. Like I said, we're, you know, we're computer scientists. We're interested in complex networks, complex processes. We're especially interested in, in clustered networks. So the networks where we have, where you, for example, have friends of friends and larger cycles. Um, so if you, take, if you take a couple of people who happen to be your friends, they are massively more likely than two people chosen at random to also be friends. Pairs of your friends are typically, but not necessarily, friends of each other. So you end up with, with cycles inside the network, which, which it turns out, unsurprisingly perhaps, change the dynamics of diseases that flow across these, these networks. And we're interested in how the fine structure affects processes. Now we've been doing this work in, in, the, in the usual academic, academic style um, until we went into lockdown and people, people who, who, who knew I worked on this stuff started asking me about it. So I decided just to write a book. Um, so we've made we tried to make the code available that we use and make it more accessible uh, and, make, and provide it with some uh, with some explanations. So available from all good bookshops. And because I'm an academic and completely inept when it comes to commerce, also also available for free online. If you want to just read it online, there's a link at the bottom of the slide. Um, now we can look at all sorts of things, and there's very little in the in in the next few minutes, which is going to be surprising to anybody who knows anything at all about disease modeling, but. At least we can reproduce it. We can show different, and we can explore the different things. So, one thing that you sometimes encounter on particular kinds of networks is called an epidemic threshold. And an epidemic threshold is where there's a there's a point at which a disease below which, a point of infectivity, a value of beta, below which a disease dies out, and above which it goes epidemic and goes everywhere. Um, you get these on various kinds of networks. Notably, you get them on um, on Erdős Rennyi networks, which, are, which have, a, have a Poisson uh, degree distribution. If you look at these two graphs, you'll notice that if we, if we, as we slide along the x-axis, which is the probability of infection, we're getting nothing, and then relatively quickly, we're everywhere. So it's a very, very rapid phase transition. You'll also notice that that, that graph is, is sort of, it, it, it's, not, it's not completely crisp, because we've done I don't know how many repetitions there, 50 or 100 repetitions at each, uh, at each point. And because it's stochastic, we've got slightly different answers each time. If we did enough, we'd be able to squeeze the variance out and get a, uh, and get a line. And the, the, the plot on the right is actually that. That's the mean with the error bars, um, the, the standard error bars. You'll notice they're not particularly big. But if we did more repetitions, those would squeeze out. And we'd end up with, with, um, with far fewer. I think that was 100 repetitions. 
Not all networks behave like this, though. Not all networks have epidemic thresholds. And it's unfortunate that the ones that do are the ones that are better models of human contact networks. So if you look at a, at a, at a, a typical model of a human contact network, I should say there's no uniform agreement of exactly what the structure of human contact networks is, and we'll actually come back to that in a, in a, in a moment or two. But one of the common models in the literature is to use what's called a power law with cutoff. So you have, you have some individuals who have lots and lots and lots of, of, of uh, links. Some individuals have, have very few. Well, there's a cutoff that doesn't allow anybody to have thousands of um, thousands of neighbours. If we do the same experiment, exactly the same experiment, but change the topology, you'll notice this does not have an epidemic threshold. Not really. Pretty much everybody is getting infected pretty much immediately. Um, it's relatively insensitive to the value of, of infection, but it is very sensitive to the exact parameters of the of the of the network distribution, the, the, the of the degree distribution. So very unlike the ER network, you get a totally different behavior just by changing the way in which the individuals are connected together. So that shows you you don't see that in most ordinary differential equation models because they don't they don't capture that that degree of structure. So we are seeing something using these techniques, which we don't see in other techniques. Um, we can look at herd immunity. Now, herd immunity is, 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 is essentially you get sufficient immune or, or removed, recovered individuals in a population that stops the epidemic pro uh, propagating. So in other words, we run an epidemic through a population and then we run it through again. But this time, some of those pop of that population has become has become removed, has been infected, and therefore is now, if it's an SIR network, is now immune. It's an SIR disease, I beg your pardon, is now is now immune. Um, you can see in these graphs what happens. The first uh, epidemic goes through roughly as you would as you would expect. The second one essentially never takes off at all. But, and why now? Why has that happened? There are still susceptible people in that network. If you look at the bottom figure, we have a population where of, uh, of red and black, after the first epidemic's gone through, we have a load of black people, black dots in that, um, I shouldn't have said black people, I beg your pardon, black dots in that diagram and red dots who are still susceptible. If we remove those ones who, were, who, are, now, uh, who, are, now who are now removed, who are no longer susceptible and run the, um, um, the disease through again, I can assure you the right-hand panel in that bottom diagram does have some infections in it. But they've got, they're, they're, it's nowhere near caught off. In fact, what, it, what essentially happens is it drops the effective, um, um, the effective mean degree of the network down. It can actually do other things as well. It can cause lot. It can cause other topological changes as well. And the effect of that is that the disease is still. It's the same disease, but it's not as. It, it won't propagate as. It can't propagate as well. Now, pursuing herd immunity has been suggested as a um, as a strategy for COVID nineteen. Um, it, it was it was suggested quite 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 early on. It was subject to something called the Great Barrington Declaration. Um, it's a really bad idea, uh, in my opinion. Um, and as I said, I'm I'm a computer scientist, so you can you can take that or leave it. It ignores some rather inconvenient facts. If you have a one percent death rate and you infect all of the UK, you end up with about seven hundred thousand excess deaths. Um, which is about one year of excess deaths. In other words, about 700,000 people die in total in a year, and you're proposing that another 700,000 will die. Um, at a rate that will collapse all possibility of, of maintaining, a, maintaining a health service, we don't know whether immunity is permanent because this is a new disease. If it isn't, or if it's only partial, then herd immunity behaves differently or it just doesn't appear at all. Uh, it, certainly the problem gets a lot more complicated. We don't really understand how, what happened in those cases. And of course, we're utterly ignoring long COVID, which may actually be some single digit percentage of the people who get COVID have, get long COVID. It's possible that more people get long COVID than die. And so that's a huge ongoing cost to those individuals and, to, and, and for healthcare. So achieving herd immunity is really not a sensible thing to, to aim for. On the other hand, you can get herd immunity without the bad bits, which is, which is otherwise known as vaccination. Um, you can randomly, uh, or you can vaccinate 60% of the population, randomly you will get pretty much herd immunity when you hit that sort of, 
that sort of threshold of 60 to 70 percent it varies depending on the disease and the topology but you get you get that sort of you need that sort of that sort of thing um you can actually do better than that that's a random that's picking 60 percent of the population at random and vaccinating them will give you that sort of herd immunity 60 70 percent um on the other hand you can actually do better than that because you can target people and if you target your vaccination program at, for example, the ones who are most likely to spread or the ones who are most likely to, to suffer adverse consequences. You can vaccinate far fewer people and still get a really good result in terms of the, in terms of the, of the, um, of the, the way the, the infection will then spread on that network. What you're essentially doing is you're taking out some of the, th some of the individuals that make the disease easy to spread, the ones with high degree, so you might say, well, who are the high degree nodes? That's obviously the healthcare workers, um, delivery drivers, people working in shops, all sorts of frontline workers. The ones that who, if they get infected, have a lot of opportunities to spread to other people. Vaccinate those guys, you can get really good reductions in disease spread without getting to the, the actual um, 60 or 70% herd immunity threshold, which is what we normally, we normally expect. Essentially, you're taking out the super spreaders. And it turns out you can get down to vaccinating only 2% of people and still get a really good result. And we've explored this in various, in various ways. What about physical distancing? We all now know and love physical distancing. What's a physically distanced contact network look like? It's actually a good question, um, especially when you, when you can start considering compliance with the, with the, um, with the physical distancing. Um, one possible model is build bubbles of people who are all connected to each other and have different sorts of sizes, let's say a mean, a mean, a mean size of four, and we'll connect them all together. There's a couple of members with outside contacts and we'll connect those bubbles together through those individuals. So what's happening then? Well, if the disease gets into a bubble, it's got a lot of possibility to spread in that bubble, but it can't really go beyond the bubble other than through those small number of people who are connected to other bubbles. Mathematically, that's what that's what physical distancing is is, is attempting to do. Um, the that changes the way that the way that propagation happens. It turns it, it turns out you get a slower takeoff if you now try and run diseases. Um, you get burst of infection as, as the as the bubbles become infected. Each bubble becomes infected, but it, it's certainly not like a power law network. It is actually sensitive to the um, to the infection uh, the the infection probability. So you get you get a different behaviour again by just by changing topology. So this is, this is the, if you like, the mathematics of why, um, of why physical distancing and, and these sorts of, 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 of uh, approaches work. Now, COVID-19 is essentially SEIR or maybe SEIRS. In other words, you've, you've, got, you've got asymptomatic infection. Um, it invites other countermeasures once you know that. Um, Self-isolating on showing symptoms is, in, is ineffective, so you have to try and find the asymptomatic carriers. That's the basis for track and trace. Take a person who becomes infected, who is, who is symptomatic, comes into the eye compartment, look at, the, look at their contacts, quarantine them if they're infected, and quarantine the, the symptomatic individual as well, and away you go. So you're trying, to, you're, you're trying to find people who are not showing symptoms but are nonetheless infected. If you do this, this is what track and trace is, is trying to do. It's a large scale procedure. I said that the countermeasures to those sorts of diseases need organization. It's kind of unfortunate. They do need organization. They require, it, they re, it requires some authority to, um, to make these things happen. It's also unlikely to be completely accurate, even if you do it competently. You're gonna have some proportion of people who, who do not quarantine. And you're gonna have, you're only gonna get to some of their contacts. You're, not gonna, you're, you're never gonna get this, get this completely, completely right. So what happens if we change those numbers? Now, we don't understand that as, as well, um, but we did do an experiment with, with, um, with this. We actually used an ER network um, for this. We held, um, we held the, 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 the quarantine fraction constant and we varied the probability of detecting infected contacts. Um, you'll notice this graph looks very, very different to, to many of the others. Um, if you have a very high detection rate, then the system seems to work rather well. Um, if you're checking less than about 40% of contacts, though, really very little is going to is going to happen. It doesn't do very much. Um, and there are, but there are all sorts of instabilities in here. I mean, look at that sort of waterfall um, effect. So, in other words, inside that that range of values of, of infection, 
there's all sorts of possibilities. It doesn't, it doesn't break between no infection and large epidemic. There's really a lot of a lot of different results. Now, we don't really understand what's going on there. Um, I, I, in retrospect, I kind of regret putting this into the book because it's the only part of the book that I can't actually stand over what it, uh, what it means. It's possible that this is something called a smeared phase transition where you don't get that sort of clean break across. Now, now I say it possibly because that idea really, really, really only turned up in the literature about a year ago. So it needs a lot more explanation in our copious free time. Um, it might actually just be an, arch an artifact of simulation. We do need to dig into it rather, rather more to, to decide what, what's going on there. So let me conclude with some, with some things. There are, we have some research directions. There are all sorts of possible ways you could go with this. We have some directions. We want to know what happens as diseases evolve. We also want to know what happens with co-infection dynamics. In other words, when two diseases move through a population and the first one changes the susceptibility of people to the second one. Um, we're also now really interested in network fine structure. What happens when we have um, physical distancing? What happens if we could disrupt some local features that might change the way a disease spread? All, all stuff to keep it to, uh, to, to keep us busy. They do something, if you're being cynical, you do say that a good research project is one that gives rise to the next research project. And, and in this case, wildly successful. This is, gonna keep, this is gonna keep us busy for years, looking at this kind of stuff. So if there are three things to take away from this talk, it would be this. Um, Epidemic spreading, epidemic processes are not fully understood. There's loads of exciting work still to do, mathematically and computationally. Um, the interactions can be really, really subtle. And it appears that, that those subtle interactions can give rise to macroscopic effects in ways that, that, that are, well, are to be expected if you're used to nonlinear systems and, and complex systems, which can be surprising and, 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 and unpredictable. My own feeling is that we can explore this space as citizen scientists. Um, we, can, we have tools available, we have computers, there's lots of computing available. We can build these sorts of simulations and explore and, and use that as citizen scientists to look, at, to look at policy, but also to counter misinformation, which is, which is increasingly a problem, which I don't think very many of us as scientists thought was going to be, to be on our patch, but certainly is, certainly is now. It's a really nice, I, I'm, like I said, I'm, an, I'm, I'm not, I'm interested in epidemic processes, not in epidemics, but I have found myself becoming a lot more interested in, in actual epidemics through this work. Um, and I hope some of you will be as well, and I'll be delighted to hear, to hear from you if you are, or to answer any questions if I can. Okay, thank you very much, Simon. Um, we do have one question in the Q&A, but I think I'll, I'll start by uh, saying thank you very much for an interesting talk. Uh, I'm really pleased to see that using Python and GitHub to share your resources. Uh, question I, I have is you, you mentioned that the maximum R naught for measles was 14. Uh, you know, if you think of smallpox and AIDS and Black Death and things like that, which, which epidemic in history had the had the highest R naught value? And if you think about modeling the, the future epidemics and possibly super epidemics, because population of the human race, you know, has grown way, way beyond what, what it probably should be. And um, whenever you look at population explosions, there's always a crash. So do you think this research could look forward to the future and help us combat kind of a super epidemic? Okay, so as far as, as, far as, I'm, a bit, as, far as I'm aware, measles is one of the most brutally transmissible diseases known to man. Um, it's massively worse than than um, most of the ones we encounter. I've, I've been I, I've been at some some meetings recently at the Newton Institute in Cambridge. Well, you know, for a suitable exam, for a suitable definition of being, I, I've, I've I've been on Zoom calls with them, and there are some people there who are who are actually experts in in epidemiology rather than people like me, and they have said that the we see about one epidemic every one pandemic every two years. Um, and this is the first one that's actually caused any major problems. Um, and, it's, and it's interesting that the one that's caused the major problems is not actually the most massively infectious. So SARS and MERS were, were massively more fatal. They had, they had hugely higher death rates, as did Ebola, but they weren't particularly transmissible. This one, not massively transmissible, not much more transmissible than a flu, than a bad flu, but, but nonetheless, very, very troublesome. It's found, it's, 
somebody at one of those meetings said that this has found a point in the policy space that's wicked and that's hard to combat in, in ways that we, we might not have predicted. In terms of super epidemics, you can you can study all of these all of these things. You can you can you can set up all sorts of disease dynamics and scales. We our limitation is the scale at which we can do this. So as I said, the differential equation formulation works for seven billion people. You know, it doesn't matter how big the numbers are. They just they you just you just plug them in and away you go. Ours doesn't work like that. I mean, when I say ours, the, the network science community doesn't work like that. There is there are other people who are using um, higher performance but less flexible tooling than we do that can go up to several million nodes uh, as opposed to 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 the to the, to the hundred thousand or so that, that, that we get. getting. You you get a benefit in performance and a, and a problem with 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 ease of use. Um, so you could certainly look at look at those things. I I had I've I've wanted for a while to look at the uh, to look at the Black Death because that didn't behave the way one might imagine in all sorts of really weird ways um, that suggest it was a function of biology interacting with um, social networks, with topology. And I've, 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 been, I've been wanting for years to have a, have a look at that and just haven't had time. Okay, we go to the Q&A uh, boxes. Um, Dimitri asks, well, he says, thank you for your excellent work and a wonderful talk describing it. Your networks are mostly very large. What if, our, what if your networks are small, say tens or hundreds of people? Does it make the modeling easier because of smaller size or harder because of extra stochasticity? Yeah, the latter. It's, it's actually worse than that. You get what's called a finite size effect, which means that stuff just doesn't happen. Um, so so all, of the, all of the mathematics underlying this is, is, based, on, um, is based on statistical physics. So it's based on the ideas that of n going to infinity. Um, so clearly, we never do that. Um, you need a you need a value of n which is large enough, and and we have the usual problem of what's large enough. Well, large enough is when it works, and and not large enough is when it doesn't work. Um, you certainly see things like epidemic threshold in networks of a thousand nodes. Um, so you can study you you can you can study some things in in nodes of that size, and the simulations are really quick. You can run an epidemic simulation over a thousand nodes in about three seconds. No, it, it's it, it's it's completely grand. Then you crank it up to um, to hundred thousand nodes, ten to the ten to the five nodes, um, and all of a sudden we 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 just we we just spent something like something like 80, 80 core days doing simulations for the, for the latest paper, because we wanted to run multiple repetitions at quite fine resolution on networks with ten to the five nodes, and it took forever. Um, fortunately, we were running on, we ran it on a compute cluster, um, but it took it, it it did literally take take day. I mean, the elapsed time was about was about three days um, to do the to do the calculations. Um, not huge in the in the you know in the scheme of things really. Um, but you do for the smaller networks, some of the things you you can you can explore quite nicely. Um, a thousand is probably you know if you're getting much below a thousand, you're you're really risking getting these these quite serious finite step finite finite size effects. Okay, I've uh, got a few more questions popping up. Uh, could you comment a bit more about targeted vaccination? In particular, more details about the comment, target high degree 2%. Yeah, so if you, so the, the idea behind targeted vaccination is you pick the people who are most likely to spread the disease and you vaccinate them preferentially. You may be vaccinating other people as well, but you vaccinate the, the, the ones who are, the, who are the, the, at the highest risk of, this, of becoming super spreaders. Um, so that might be, for example, the people who have very public exposure, um, delivery drivers, um, people who meet lots and lots and lots of people. Um, it turns out that if you that you can you can pick up that it, it turns out that those high degree nodes are disproportionately driving the progress of the disease. In other words, if somebody with a, with very high degree gets infected, they have the possibility to, to infect large numbers of people, very, all their contacts are very, very large numbers of people compared to, um, so, you know, cousin Melanie, who's a, who's a big party animal and goes, goes off to parties, meets lots of different people and can infect them. Whereas great aunt Sally, who is a noted recluse, if she gets infected, she's not going to meet very many people at all. So in that sense, you, you pick the, the ones with the most opportunity to spread and you vaccinate them. And it turns out that those people disproportionately spread the disease in these, particularly in these power law networks, in these ones that 
where where you have a, you have a very uh, a very wide distribution of, of contacts. So and it and it if you look at something like two percent of, of the of the you pick you pick the two percent of the people in the network of the highest degree and vaccinate them, you get you can get good results. Now, of course, you, you can't necessarily do that in, in public policy terms. You can do it mathematically and in simulation really easily. Um, much, much more difficult to do in, to do in the real world. Okay. Uh, we're getting short on time, so that's, this will have to be the last question. Uh, Arcady asks, have you thought about what areas of public policy decisions to look at in particular, and are you working with any pu public policy experts? Um, I'm not. Um, I have I have interacted with some, as I said, I was at these meetings in the in the Newton Institute. Um, I don't know. There are lots of people much more knowledgeable about modeling than I am working in these in these areas. There was a the Royal Society ran a ran a program uh, called Ramp Rapid a Rapid Access to Modeling for the Pandemic, um, which we were we were tangentially involved with, but not not particularly. Um, some hugely uh, respected and experienced experts in there. Um, our contribution is much more modest. Um, perhaps, perhaps the best contribution we, we've 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 been making is to public understanding. I'm trying to make it to public understanding rather than to rather than to policy. Okay, thank you, Simon. I'm afraid we've run out of time there. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time. It's a really interesting talk and obviously very topical uh, during these current times. If anybody, uh, thank you, thank you for coming. If anybody would like to ask questions, if you want to email me. Um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be happy to try and answer questions offline if that would if that would be of interest to anybody. Yeah, so, so if anybody does have burning questions, uh, you can find uh, Simon Dobson's help homepage quite easily. Simon Dobson, St. Andrews University. And is your is your email address easily visible there, Simon? Yeah, Simon Dobson at St. Andrews AC UK. There are, there are two Simon Dobsons. There's me and one of, and, a, and, a, and a brass band composer from, from Cornwall. So we're fairly easy to, do, it's fairly easy to differentiate between. Okay, thank you, Simon. Very welcome, thank you.